you can make someone a higher performing employee because you help them feel part of the mission, the vision. The headliner there is truth. Is mm-hmm. that truth that between people? Because that's how I feel comfortable. I feel that I can be successful. How can we fit the learning into their day? You know, does having a long six week program make sense when they can barely get five minutes? Hey everyone, welcome back to the Kirkpatrick Podcast. It is your favorite hosts, Jim and Vanessa. Hey Jim, how are you? I think you might be the favorite host. I might come in second place, but I'm I'm good and I'm glad to be doing another recording with you. Yes, we are so excited to be talking today about enhancing employee engagement, but more specifically engagement to lead to performance and not just engagement for engagement's sake, or like Jim likes to share a a kumbaya moment. Um, So with that, I just want to really quickly take my moment to give you all the Kirkpatrick update. So it is your last call for in-person bronze and silver certification happening September 4th through 6th in Dulles, Virginia. So if you're in the Dulles area, please make sure that you sign up ASAP. We want to make sure that you're there. It is the only time we are also um, offering that third day in person where you can actually work on your blended evaluation plan, uh, get your homework done, and work side-by-side with um, a Kirkpatrick facilitator. There is also still time to access our government year-end deals and savings. These are discounts on our online U.S. broadcasted certification programs, and we have a brand new one added for October. We have a consulting and impact study savings as well as curriculum design, so make sure you visit our website or the show notes for more details. We have officially launched the Kirkpatrick Community Make sure you access exclusive savings on your annual membership. Um, And so you can uh, click the link to also access that. And then as a reminder, we are on the GSA schedule to make purchasing easier for our government and military friends. All right, Jim, really quick, for anyone that is new, can you run through what the four levels of the Kirkpatrick model are as it is today? Wait a second. Let me, I've got it written down here. No, I know it. <laughs> really quick. Well, at level one is we want to make sure people are engaged in whatever delivering of the training and learning is happening and that they're finding relevance. Because then what happens if they're involved, they're going to learn and they're going to find relevance, then they're going to move to level two with our help. And that means that they are learning something that hopefully is going to be something that they can use. I know a lot of things they're learning isn't, there's a lot of different reasons, but we want to specifically focus on the learning that is designed to help them do their job better. And that is the the bridge, we call it, the pathway from level two learning into the world of performance. Now, learning continues. We don't want you to think that learning stops and performance takes over because the learning will continue. And there's more and more of that happening these days because people are finding we need to learn something very quickly because something has come up that we need to improve performance. But we also don't believe that because they learn they're going to do it at level mm-hmm. three just automatically. So we have what we call required drivers. That's coaching and mentoring and job aids and touch bases and things that will help protect the learning investment to make sure people actually apply it. And then we don't stop there. Once they're applying it, we're making sure they are with accountability and support. Then we start to see level four begin. Level four is not just the end, did it work, but it, is it working along the way in level four? Fingers on the pulse, are we seeing improvements? What kind of responses are we getting from our shareholders or from our clients or patients or customers, whatever? And yeah. that is the level four and it continues up towards the the mission as much as the the power that is within the the whole structure. So that's that's it. It's a very dynamic. It isn't just smile of sheet, pre and post test and a 90 day survey. It is ongoing evaluation to help create ongoing performance and value. That's what I think it is. Yeah, I mean, good thing that you know it well. (laughs) 
Perhaps I'd have to pull you off as a facilitator. Yes. Yes. I'd have to retire. <laughs> well, we don't want that. We don't want that. Um, so thank you for sharing. And I think you made a really good uh, distinction for folks. The learning doesn't stop. Right. And what you're doing is you're providing opportunities to continue to learn to help transfer that to performance and engage your folks and meeting them where they're at. So one of the things that I think as an industry we fail at doing is doing what is easiest for us to deliver. And what I mean by that is um, we are not doing a very good job understanding what makes our learners um, tick, what makes what sparks, you know, the, you know, that's good. An idea. Wait, how do they like, do they have any preferences? You know what I mean? Like what, how can we fit the learning into their day? You know, does having a long six week program make sense when they can barely get five minutes in their day? Right. Um, how are we doing these things in order to engage them? And one of the biggest things that I chat with folks about is meeting our people where they're at. If they don't have an hour for your e-learning program, give them the highlight in a 30 second video, in a 60 second video to entice them and encourage them to get into um, the longer form content. Um, or also, if you can get it done in 30 to 60 seconds, you probably didn't need the 45 minute training, but that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the model while it has always traditionally, another one of your favorite words, been used for learning, it's not just a learning model, right? It's a change model. It's a way to look at how are we engaging folks. It's a way to continuously evaluate whether what it is that we are putting our time, money, and our resources towards our people does it make sense? And what is the impact on the business? So we have so many employee engagement initiatives and things like that. Do we even know if they're working or do we even know if that's what people want or how they want to um, be engaged with? We need to be evaluating that and evaluating whether, whether our investment in those initiatives makes sense. Does that seem fair? Or did I just go off the rails and onto a soapbox? Vanessa, I, I got to confess, I, I'm co-facilitating this with you, but I just turned into a learner. I <laughs> have to toggle back because uh, you, you said some things that I think are so so important. And you use yeah. the word change. We don't mm -hmm. we don't use that very much in a, in our world. At least I don't hear it very much. But I think you're you're talking about changing in people. Right, you're trying to create this this internal motivation rather than the external, you know, the stick stick kind of thing. But it's yeah. also change in desired results. That's the whole purpose. Is we want to change people so they change their contributions, and then it helps collaboratively to change whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. And mm -hmm. so that word, I loved it. So let's run through the four levels using the lens of how are you going to engage an employee in order to elicit performance, right? So no one's here to engage their employees just because they want to, you know, engage an employee. You want to engage your employees to get better performance and outcomes out of them, right? You want to retain them longer so that they continue to perform at their highest levels. So let's start with level four always starting with the end in mind, how can organizations, Jim, identify key outcomes for each employee? And could you provide maybe some examples of what those outcomes might be? Uh, you're talking about for each employee, for, for employees here, not, not brand. Uh, and kind yeah, of right, for each, yeah, for an employee. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we have to break tradition and think that a, a one-year performance review is going to do the job. Right. You know, yeah. This is more of a dynamic model. So I think it is that the supervisor, you know, has to be wise about what they think 
the critical behaviors, the most important behaviors are that someone needs to be doing in order to make their contribution, keep themselves engaged. And it needs to be aligned with the goals of that department to that, that uh, unit or whatever. And then it's a collaboration rather than just handing someone say, here's, here's your job description and here are the, 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 the behavior you're supposed to do. It needs to be, that's the first point where there's collaboration and trust is built like what? What do you think, you know, Vanessa? What What do you think of these? Which of these do you think is more important? Being an employee in this in this particular area, mm-hmm. and then they agree on that, and so far, and already they're in agreement with something. They're having that conversation of building trust. That is the launching point from yeah. yeah the rest happening from there. Yeah. So um, we will be working on bringing on board some new folks. And it's something that I do often is I co-create key performance indicators with them, right? And what I'll do is, you know, I'll say, this is the vision for the business. Here are my ideas and my recommendations of what we want to be measuring. And to your point, how does that sound to you? Does that sound doable, sound achievable, right? And if it doesn't, let's talk about why, right? Is there a skill set that you might not have or you might not feel um, as um, strong in that we need to help support you with? Or does that just feel like that's completely out of your comfort zone? And, you know, maybe that's, you know, is there something else we can do with that that part of the role? The nice thing is, is that, you know, usually that part doesn't happen um, very often. It's usually tweaking specifics with the key performance indicators. But to your point, now, I've given them the vision of the organization and I've given them, here's what I think, you know, what I'm going to be looking for as your manager, as your boss um, and how I see you influencing those things. Right. So for us, maybe it's getting more people to attend our certification programs, right. For hiring a salesperson, they're not solely responsible. You know, I know there's other factors that, um, affect our sales, right? Um, budget seasons, the beautiful economy or not so beautiful economy we have right now. Mm -hmm. Um, there are other factors that are outside of that salesperson's control. Um, but I am able to give them key performance indicators. This is what I want you to hit, make them achievable, not super easy where they're getting by, but I also don't want to be sky high, you know, get giving them a key performance indicator that I know is not, um, accessible. And then let's give them a realistic key performance indicator. Let them hit that. And what I'm doing is I'm collecting the leading indicators, right, from the business and saying, we hit, you know, X number of of seats, you know, in the business. And if they're not on track, I'm comparing that with their um, performance plan. Um, I'm sorry, with their key performance indicator, we have a scorecard for them. Um, And then we're, you know, having a co-collaboration of like what might've happened. Sometimes it's, they didn't have enough calls. You know, they didn't, you know, meet enough people. Or sometimes it's simply, it's a weird budget season. It's a weird time right now, or, you know, whatever that might be, or the people that I called are not coming in until like for like another month or something like that because of their budget. It's a way for us to co-collaborate and understand that we are going to be looking at, you are going to have expectations. Here is how I'm going to tie the organizational's goals to your performance, but also know that your performance is not the only thing that is um, going to be the sole reason that the organization hits or does not hit their mark. I got it. I got a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Because I have worked for organizations in the past and many people have where nobody sits down with them and first of all, really helps clarify or, or uh, have a collaboration about their behaviors, but even fewer ever tied employees in with the mission with the mm-hmm. vision. And why don't, if you wouldn't mind co- yeah. sharing a, a, a contrast between where you have seen those situations where people just, they go to do their job. They don't even believe that anybody cares that they're making a contribution. Yeah. They don't even know what the division or the department goals are that somebody else's. Compare that 
with the way that you do it and that you tie people in and and, and how they may think, why are it's terrific you're telling this. You must think that I can contribute to it, but you're also going to put me on the rails to make sure that I don't just go off my own way. Yeah, great question. I've been on both sides of that. <clears throat> and yeah. I have always found that when I feel a part of the mission, <clears throat> it's something bigger than just myself and my job, right? If I want to go in and just clock in and clock out, um, usually it's because I haven't been engaged with, um, and I don't really understand how my role affects the higher, the higher, um, mission of the organization or, um, helps towards the mission. And I just, I'm just not, I'm not really planning on staying, to be honest. I'm using it as a stepping stone. Because I believe that high performing employees want to feel part of something bigger than themselves. And you can make someone a higher performing employee because you help them feel part of the mission, the vision, and you co-create with them. When you can give them those things and the space to, you know, you know, not micromanage them in the space to let their uh, zone of genius shine, that is where you will see that engagement and retention. But when we micromanage, assume they know because they read the orientation manual or they listen to the HR specialist run through, oh, here at X, Y, and Z Corp, we believe that. Okay, cool. How many people have a mission statement that like they don't truly really believe in or really understand what it even means? Yeah. You know, and so I notice a difference in myself and I consider myself a high performer, a high achiever, an overachiever. I second that. <laughs> Thank you. So if I have, if I'm admitting that not feeling part of an organization makes me a low achiever, but in general, I'm a high achiever. I can only imagine how much that is happening in our own organizations. And so what do we do? We go back to, they're not doing their job. They're not, you know, they can't handle this role. They're not as good as we thought that they were. Their performance issues, needing performance improvement plans, and eventually a layoff of that person. What if we just talk to them? and help them understand how their role is so important to the mission of the organization, you could save yourself that turnover. You had two, you said two things I, I'd like to follow yeah. up with, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, I have worked for companies and, and, and you, you have two others of you want listening and watching that you're not exactly sure what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You know, you may have a job description, but full, full, three pages full of stuff, but the, just to, uh, Last night, an email came to me with, with something that was a document that is part of a collaboration effort we're concerned. And I was mm -hmm. I looked at it and I, I thought, huh. So I I, I uh, right away, I emailed back to Vanessa. I think it was maybe while you were sleeping. And then she got right back. No, it's on my morning walk. Were you? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Well, she got right back to me and said, here is what I want you to do with that. Yeah. Now, you know what that does for me? That gives me a piece. Because in the past, if I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do, sometimes I go overboard. Sometimes I don't do what I'm supposed to do or, or yeah. I don't even know. This gives me confidence and peace. And that's why we talk, talk about even a, a collaboration. When people know what they're supposed to do at level three, it does a, a, gr a great favor to them rather than them guess. And, and Vanessa knows well enough that I am not a multitasker. There are a lot of things I can do at any one time that are good. So you're always good about, Jim, this is most important right now. This isn't. Yeah. And the other thing that you you use the word retention. I mm -hmm. heard you say that. You know what a collateral benefit of all this community is? Mm -hmm. People are not going to quit. Yeah. And they're not going to be a statistic of attrition. Instead, they are going to be ambassadors and they're going to be recruiters themselves because they have had a good experience both personally and professionally in their work. So everyone's coming up with ideas. How do we recruit better? You recruit better internally by treating the people in the way that we're suggesting. Thank you for sharing that because, um, and also giving me feedback on my leadership because I always yep. am looking for room for improvement. So thank you. I also feel that we use a scapegoat of someone saying, oh, I left because they're going to give me more money. 
which sometimes that is true, right? You're not getting paid a reasonable Maybe. wage. And, you know, we all know that life is expensive these days. My parents just went to the grocery store and complained to me that it was $104 when they didn't buy a lot of things. And they didn't because now we live in another state, so they're not buying for my children. <laughs> so things are expensive these days. So I do want to be very cognizant. We understand that. And that is always, not always, sorry, that is often a cop out because the true reason. Um, that someone leaves um, can often be they didn't know their place. They didn't feel a part of it. They weren't clear on what their expectations were. So these critical behaviors are not defined. So of course, they're not going to be able to lead to performance. Of course, they're not going to feel like they know what to do. And they're going to either skate by or go overboard. And that's, you know, not, they're going to be allocating their own resources properly. And <clears throat> One of the things that I find very interesting about how we're having this conversation, I don't know if people are picking up on this yet. I said we were going to run through these levels one by one, but I don't think we've run through four on its own. I think we're talking about level three at the same time. Because you can't do level four if you haven't defined for the person their behaviors. Right? So I think we, we do talk about you need to know what the end result is. And level four, number one, but like that's one A, one B is those critical behaviors, like the next thing we need to define. And I think if we are looking at it separately and we're looking at um, employee engagement separately in those pieces, that's going to lead to um, number one, not getting done because it feels like another step. Right. And number two, um, you know, people won't feel as clear as to their behaviors and tying those back to the organizational outcomes. They've got to come together. Now, you know, you know something there, so let you use the, you're right in using word critical behaviors, but we want to make a, a distinction mm -hmm. that is not all the things on your list of your job description. Mm -hmm. Those are not a sack full of 22 competencies, you know, what the what the definition is is the few the few critical behaviors that need to be performed consistently on the job. As I talk to some people and say, "Oh, we work for this company. This company, everything is is critical." No, the people can't do a whole lot of things. The, the research says four or five things is the most that any normal person is able to focus on in any given in any given situation. So we're talking about really scaling it down to the ones that you're really going to lift up and the ones you're going to hold accountable that will make a difference, not competency model and not job description. Yeah. And to your point, I couldn't agree more. People can focus on 20 things. Those 20 things should probably roll up to those four to five critical behaviors. And so I think yes. that's a shift you need to look at when you're looking at, well, what are the critical behaviors? It's these 20 things. No, no, no. You need to actually look at it. And almost like we did when, we, um, when I came on board and we wanted to define our core values for Kirkpatrick Partners, I had everybody, you know, on a sticky note, write out what they thought a core value should be. And then we started to group them and then came up with, um, ours was seven, because um, I couldn't give some of them up. But uh, seven critical or seven core values, right? And yeah. so you could do the same thing with your with your um the bullet points in your job post, right? When you start to combine them, a lot of them are probably grouped similarly and have a similar similar critical behavior. It's just a matter of being a little uh, thinking critically, a little bit outside the box how they are all grouped together, and that's how you can find your critical behaviors. You know, I. I remember I was a, a director of training for a bank in, in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the U.S. And I had a, a boss who was the CEO, report directly to the CEO. And she was very artsy and she was very, you know, things like that. And I really couldn't get much out of her. You know, she wanted to talk about the symphony rather than my work. And so I had an annual uh, performance review. So I came in and she said, what kind of things have you been doing? I said, well, this, 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 and this. She said, that's not what I wanted you to be doing at all. So, right. You feel like you completely missed the mark. But to that right. point, right, Jim, are there things that your CEO could have done to ensure you were on the right track? Yes. 
She could have had meetings on a quarterly basis about performance. And I could have gone and said, well, I won't say her name. Mm -hmm. uh, here is what I am planning on doing. Here's what I'm thinking I'm spending my time. Could you please circle the ones that are most important? And I think she would have done that. Yeah. But I just was plowing along, kind of my own guy doing their own, their own thing, assuming, A, that she wouldn't care because she was more concerned about the symphony and the art festival. Mm -hmm. and, and B, I, I didn't. I didn't think to check because I, I knew I was right and I was not. <laughs> well, I think to your point, right? I think we, we operate often from a world of no news is good news. Um, and they, that might not always be the case. Well, I got to tell you one more quick thing. Yeah. The performance review, uh, she said, okay, th this was the next year. She did it different. She said, give me a list of five people that you work well with. So I gave the you know director of retail banking and consumer lending gave them. The, then she said, "All right, give me the names of five people that you don't get along with, you don't work well." So I, I gave her those, and then Ooh. she turned in her chair and she starts typing. I say, "What are you doing?" She says, "I'm emailing that second list of people because I want to get their feedback about you." Oh, the ones that I didn't get along with. She said, "I know what the ones that they like you," and I thought, "Oh man, I wish I hadn't mm -hmm. given her some of those names." Because, but she wanted the truth. She said, "I know those five love you, but the other ones, I'm going to get their feedback." So I oh, every she changed performance review rules every year, mm -hmm. but that was one that uh, came back and bit me. I um, <laughs> that makes me think um of why I hate so much references. Because like, who is going to give a reference that is not going to be like totally loving on you? I mean, there have definitely been surprises, and I am part of HR Facebook groups, communities. Um, shout out if you have not seen the community episode, make sure you check out the community episode. Um, but I, where people do call the reference, and the reference is not a great reference. Um, but to the same point, right? I think you're what you're touching on. This episode is going to end up being so long. Um, <laughs> what you're touching on is that the idea of a 360 feedback. When it comes to performance um, evaluation and, or sorry, performance reviews, and it's not just giving the five people that you work really well. You also need to know the five people that you're not working really well with, and at some place in the middle is the actual truth of the performance. That's a good point. Yeah, and I and that's where I think when we talk about for me level three, and we talk about. Um, multiple sources, multiple methods. That's what I'm talking like. That's part of what I mean, right? Because if we're only going to one source of truth, either the people that don't like working with you or the people that do like working with you, that's not, there's no, there's no truth there, right? So when you're triangulating your data sources, that's where you can get to the truth and be able to then provide someone actual ways that they can improve their performance and be able to support them. And Vanessa, I've heard you talk about a culture of evaluation and that the, the, the headliner there is truth. Mm -hmm. Is that truth be between people? Because that's how I feel comfortable and I feel that I can be successful and, and I'm trusted. And, it, and so the, the, this community really is about truth and how we relate to each other and the data and information that we use to make more of the tactical improvements. Absolutely. And... I think for now, I'm going to leave the episode here because I think I want people to really, I don't want to overwhelm everyone because this is a deep conversation and a big conversation when it comes to employee engagement because I want you guys to think about and look at your own plans and strategies for your employees. Have you, have you told them what the mission and goal of the organization are? Have you, so, and if you have, do they know how they um, are a part of that mission and how their job helps to achieve that? And if not, well, and then the third thing I want you to think of is, have you told your employees exactly what their critical behaviors are? That's your homework from this episode. And then if they don't know these things, I want you to have, think about your next one-on-one -on -one with your employees and start to define those things. I like to call it like a re-onboarding, a nice reset, refresh. I love a New Year's 
situation. You know this. I was married on New Year's Eve. I love a resolution. I love goal setting. Today is August 1st that we are filming this. So I am like goal ready and like reset ready because it is the first, you know, day of the month. Your employees are also looking for that. Even if they've been there 20 years, they could use a refresh, a rejuvenation of their role um, and engagement with the organization. So start there. Do your employees know what the mission is and the vision is of the organization? Do they know how they can help to achieve that mission, why their job is there in order to achieve that mission? And do they know what their critical behaviors are? Then I want you to come back to the next episode and we are going to continue, pick back up with level three, because I want to talk a little bit about what can we put in place in order to help continue that support and ensure it's not just a one-time thing during performance um, review time that we're having those conversations. Sound fair, Jim? Sounds real good. Awesome. Friends, thank you so much for listening. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Give us your feedback. I would love to know from you how your employee engagement strategy where you um, is going, where you all are struggling, where you all need support. Have you ever used the levels to think about employee engagement? We'd love to know that too. And we will catch you on the next episode. Bye y'all. Bye.